So let's talk then about Steve Boyd. So that's what comes next. Again, now we're getting yes. ourselves out of order and we filmed it. Um, we realized, okay, we got to talk about the importance of catastrophe. We talk about the importance of paradigm. So now we got to go to the text. Mm -hmm. What did you think about being and, 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 and what did you think was the takeaways from that? Well, first of all, it was fascinating to be able to go into that museum and have uh, Dr. Steve Boyd uh, walking back into these vaults. I walked back into some of oh. those with him and it just, there was scrolls upon scrolls that were just stacked everywhere, ancient, ancient scrolls. And they pull these out and of course we rolled them out on, on the table. Uh, where we could actually look at some of those very, very old uh, documents. But the so so that, that's the thing here. So when you may not realize when I set this up, that's where Steve went to school. And mm -hmm. he had studied under Professor Kaufman, a, a really brilliant um, Jewish scholar, a Hebraic um, scholar. And this is Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Institute of Religion. Um, and there in Cincinnati, they are the repository for the majority of their texts. So many of them have come, and they're in Los Angeles and New York and Jerusalem, and then they're in Cincinnati. Right. But they have some of the best, and Dr. Mm -hmm. David Gilner, the, um, who runs the, the, the library there, um, incredibly, just a, a brilliant man and so incredibly helpful to us. But he began to pull these out on the table, right. and then our camera guys are moving around. He kind of leaned over me and said, you know, there's about $5 million worth <laughs> of goods. Because these are priceless, but just on this table, right. and that didn't revolve. So I think that just the mm -hmm. access that Dr. Boyd got us mm -hmm. and Dr. Gilner then worked, they really, the, it was a, of a lot of respect for the Hebrew Union mm -hmm. College, just a really yeah. great institution. But so anyway, we're, we're yeah. looking at these. Yeah, and so, but, but it, it also uh, points out again, just uh, the, the sacredness with with which these yes. these scrolls and the text are are held, and as as Dr. Boyd was talking about how uh, the Jewish scribes believed they were involved in the writing down of God's word and how carefully yes, that's right uh, they uh, checked and rechecked and had the means by which they could ensure that what they wrote was not something different than what had been passed down to them because what had been passed down to them was the Word of God. Uh, and of course, then we looked at the, at the text in the Genesis 1 through 11 and talked to him uh, about it. I think one of the things that struck me on that was, was his statement, uh, and the viewers of the film uh, would recall this, where he said that there is, no, there is no Hebraist in the world who would look at this and see it as anything except that historical narrative genre. And that's what we've been talking about before. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the natural reading of, of the text. You have to come with another paradigm first in order to want to try to change it into another genre. No, I think that's right. I mean, um, Kasuto, uh, the great rabbinic scholar, argues this. He has one of the best commentaries, and he says it. Now, he didn't hold it to be real history, but he held that they did. And so I think it's very curious as you have both these conservative uh, scholars and these liberal scholars who both point at the text and say, well, no, no, it's narrative. And they say, well, I think it's actual historical narrative. And they say, well, I think it's historical narrative. It's just not true. But they agree that it's this genre mm -hmm, is a historical mm -hmm, narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of the presuppositions they both bring to this, uh, to the text. And then you have this group in the middle that says, well, no, I, I think it's actually some, you know, poetry or symbolism or whatever. And they're very, very small. And they, I think it's a, they struggle between these two folks who agree mm -hmm. that it's historical narrative. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that's probably the big takeaway there is that Genesis presents itself as a book of historical narrative that's understandable. It is talked about in the rest of the scripture as historical narrative. And as historical narrative, it segues and touches mm -hmm. the real world. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, I think it was important yeah. for us to have Steve Boyd go through the text and discuss it, because a lot of people don't realize what's in those first 11 mm -hmm. chapters, because yeah. I don't think it gets taught as right. much. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I realize that most people learn it when they are getting um, children's story Bibles. So they see it in kind of this plush toy, you know, colorful picture sort of way of the ark and Adam and Eve in the garden. And I think that that's a potentially a dehistoricizing influence because it seems like it's nice little child stories, felt board stuff. <coughs> and I think that when you realize this is the idea of a water ball and um, that Peter talks about, you know, in Second Peter, he talks about being formed through water, and um, that these are real people who sweat and, you know, worked and, you know, died. I mean, I, I think the really interesting story is you go read the Gilgamesh story. Mm -hmm. So if you've read Gilgamesh, which is a, you know, I would argue, as would he, that it is a, it is a pagan or a secular looking back at the same event. 
So when I think it's, um, I never get his name right. He goes and meets, you know, the, the Noah or the Shem or whoever the character is. But he talks about seeing all the dead bodies mm -hmm. floating on the water. And that's a very mm -hmm. moving picture of this mm -hmm. reality that there were, the text, when you look at it, it only says so much that there was a great deal of real catastrophe right. in the text. Right. Um, major things happening at creation, major things mm -hmm. happening at the fall, major things happening at the right. flood. Yeah. And I think that's what Steve Boyd really mm -hmm. opened up our eyes to, that the text is really vital and you right. gotta start there. Yeah, I was uh, uh, sent um, by one of my friends who is an old earth creationist, uh, his rebuttal uh, to uh, Dr. Boyd's uh, comments pointing back uh, to a council on inerrancy and so forth that was, was held in the 80s. And their conclusion uh, regarding this text uh, was that uh, one could uh, read it in different ways. One could read it in terms, yom in particular was the word, and we did, talked about that mm -hmm. word with uh, Dr. Boyd, that it could be read as long ages and so forth. But it was interesting because uh, even the, the document that he sent to me, it wasn't as a result of looking at the text, it was a result of the text and the current scientific paradigm. So it was in light of the current scientific paradigm that that council then said you can read it both ways, which re reaffirms what we were saying with Dr. Boyd. He said, you, the only way for you to come to this text and read it in a different way is as if you have some other paradigm that's driving you oh, to yeah. do so. The history of exegesis is too clear there. No one uses it that way, word day. I mean, Moses doesn't, and there's there in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the Ten Commandments, yeah. the, uh, the Fourth Commandment about um, the reason you've got a week is because yes. God created a week. He did it in a week as a structure for us. Yeah. I mean, as, as, as he could have done any amount of time, but he chose a week um, because that was what he wanted our mm -hmm. lives while we have a week here. But it's funny, we had one of our reviewers say, well, you know, it's a one-day event, this, you know, your film. Uh, does that mean it's going to be on for eons of time? No, <laughs> no yeah. one talks about day that way. Right. There's nowhere else in the scripture mm -hmm. it gets used. Even a day, the day of David, well, it's mm -hmm. contextually. They're not using the one day of David, the two days of David. No, no, no. Day one, day two, day three. Yeah. You just can't get away from it. And so the hope is that if you ignore some of these points, then you can somehow kind of work mm -hmm. in because then, I mean, we'll be, then, I think, a I guess accepted more by the secular sure. review, yeah. which really aren't going to accept us anyway. But so Steve Boyd, I think, really established the primacy of the text. The text <laughs> teaches mm -hmm. six days. The text teaches a real fall, a real out of the text teaches a global flood, and this interesting question of genealogies. And he talked a lot about genealogies, yep. this Toledot, and, and I think that's important of the mm -hmm. Luke three genealogy. Mm -hmm. Most people forget that that Luke right. three genealogy is there. That is the bookends. I mean, it gives you the beginning and the end of Adam to Jesus, and the idea that you can find lots and lots of, of other gaps in there is just, it's just very strange exegetically. I mean, they'll point to Matthew and say, well, you know, Matthew, is, it's three sets of 14, but the only reason we know that is because you can go back to the Old Testament and see what Matthew is doing. He kind of says that. He even calls attention that I'm making a numerical structure here for a mm -hmm. point. Right. And right. so this idea that you would, and this is what the progressive creationist has to do, they take that, that list of you know, 76, 77 names, and they're forced to say that this is just representative. This is only one-tenth of the names to make it fit with Adam mm -hmm. being 50,000 or 100,000 mm -hmm. years old. So the need to constantly make the scripture plastic and rubber to bend mm -hmm. things into it, you see it happening over and over again with these, right. you know, a, a, a hermeneutic, this is, well, I gotta bring this in. It's, it's actually, great. I think it was Carl Henry that said it, you know, it's, it's a scientifico, uh, conceptual exegesis, uh, mm -hmm. that basically a scientific concept mm -hmm. is applied to the exegesis. Yeah, and that, and that uh, genealogy that is given to us in Luke is another prime example as to why would someone read that genealogy differently unless you had another reason, you have a paradigm. And the paradigm is we have to have a uh, long time, and so the long time drives us to then say, well, then it has to be something else. So you're assuming this is true uh, in order to read the text. So the Bible is filled with these checks and balances, and I think that's what Steve pointed out.